morning, church family. Thanks for joining us online as we watch the service together from our homes. I know this is different. It's probably going to feel a little weird, but this is a really unique opportunity for us to really pour in and disciple our children in our homes. And so to help you do that today and for the future Sundays as we are all at our homes, we want you to engage with your children using our family worship guide that we created. And to access the family worship guide, what you're going to do is you're going to use the LBC app. You're going to click on the media icon in the bottom right hand corner and find the LBC kids section. And from there, you'll find the family worship guide with today's date. On the family worship guide, we're going to have definitions of some key words that Eric is going to discuss from Psalm 46. It's also going to have some questions that you can ask your children and then some discussion points that we want you to review with your children. It's not going to take a long time and it's not going to be crazy. Just keep it simple. And I'm promising you it'll be a great time with your family. So we pray that you would take advantage of that. And so with that, look for more resources from us for families, for parents, um, including Sunday school lessons and the family devotional that goes with that. And that's just an extra tool in your toolbox if you want to use it uh, during this time when we're at home. So we pray that today would be a blessing. We pray that you would have a nice, comfortable time, have a good discussion after the sermon, and uh, take advantage of the time that you might be able to sit in your pajamas and watch uh, Eric preach. That's rare, right? So enjoy your time. We will see you soon, and God bless you guys. Hey, good morning, church family, and welcome to our living room. We're going to do some family worship this morning, and this is my family. And my lovely wife is joining us today, Kristen. Hey, good morning, church family. My name is Kristen. And let's no, no, look no, 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 oh. no. We're just going to do worship this morning. Gotcha. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Okay, so church, I know that it's a little bit strange today, and that's okay. If you got kids watching, hey guys, out there in the world, we're so excited to be able to worship from our living room to your living room this morning. And so here we go. We're going to start things off with the word of the Lord. The word of God from Psalms 107 says this, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those whom he has redeemed from trouble. You guys, adults, kids, that's us. We're the ones whom God has redeemed. We are the ones who are the saved. And so we get to sing this morning. And I know it might be a little bit strange since we're not in our sanctuaries, but that's okay because we're going to sing from our living rooms. We're going to sing from our hearts. So join us now. Kids, you're going to know this one. And adults, please join in. We're going to sing now about the King of everything, Jesus Christ. So let's lift him high. Here we go. One, two, three, four. Yours is the greatness. Yours is the greatness. Yours is the power. Yours is the victory. Sing to God. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the majesty. And you are king of everything.
our righteousness only Jesus who opens up our eyes only Jesus who reaches down for us only Jesus who shows the Father's love only Jesus the dark to light, only Jesus. There's no one like you. There's no one like you. You stand alone. No greater love was ever shown. You are a rescue, only Jesus. High and exalted upon your throne, no greater name was ever known. You are our refuge, holy Jesus, who saves us from our sin, only Jesus. Who's coming back again? Only Jesus. Who holds the keys to life? Only Jesus. Let's sing it to him now. He's holy. There's no one like you. There's no one like you. You stand alone. No greater love was ever shown. upon your throne no greater name was ever known you are our refuge holy Jesus and you are holy we bring no praise to stand alone no greater love was ever shown you are a rescue only Jesus so Jesus we do thank you and we praise you that you are our rescue you are our refuge and ever-present help in time of trouble and we can always turn to you. So God, may you be glorified in and through our lives as we trust in you. Give us grace, Jesus, to trust you evermore. And bless this time as we open your word. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning, LBC family. So excited you guys could join us this morning for a time of worship and reading of God's Word. And uh, I know things look different this morning. Yeah, yeah. Oh, hold on, sorry for that, guys. Yes, honey. Hug? Um, honey, I'm, I'm quarantined. I can't, but I can give you an air hug. Okay, good job, honey. Go. Yeah. Sorry about that. As you can see, things are a little different. Uh, you might be wondering, where's my wife? She's practicing social distancing right now, making sure that she's far enough away to abide by the rules. Uh, but we're excited. We're going to try this out, and we're going to do our best to communicate God's word to our family faithfully while also abiding by the rules. And so to start this morning, uh, my daughter's going to come up and have our scripture reading from Psalm 46. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Therefore, he, he, we, will, we will not fear, though the earth gives, gives way, though the mountains be moved into earth, into the sea or part of the sea, though its waters roar in foam, though the mountains tremble at its swellings, there, there, there is a river whose streams make glad this, there is a, the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when the morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Good job, honey. Air high five. Good job. Well, so glad you guys could be here this morning. I'm going to be reading from Psalms 46 and uh, preaching from Psalms 46. Uh, but before we do that, I'd just like to... Um, cover a few things before we get into the text and just, you know, acknowledge that things are different. Uh, acknowledge that I miss seeing all you guys. I miss being near our church family. Uh, it's important for you to know that the leadership is praying for you and is trying to reach out and be there if you need them during this time. Um, we're committed to walking with you in excellence and also following the rules. It's also important to know that uh, our staff has been adapting. Uh, with all these rapid changes, and I want to thank them for all their hard work to push things to social media and media platforms so that we could communicate with you and be with you. I also want to thank Kyle up here for producing uh, our podcast and now our sermon so that we have uh, an excellent way of bringing God's word and communicating with our people. And we also want you to know that we're caring for our seniors. Uh, the Pastor Roger has a team of people in place to help love them and serve them and he checks on them. If you'd like to help with that, uh, I would encourage you to get in contact with him via email on the website or uh, by text message. And so we're thankful for his leadership towards our seniors in that way. Um, also, just want to cover a few things. Uh, make sure we're praying for our government officials. Uh, they're in a very hard time and uh, they're moving fast and they need God's wisdom. And so we want to pray for them. Uh, we want to be in accordance with Romans 13.1, which reads, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. And so we want to trust that God has these people in place, and we want to pray for those leaders. I'm not saying you have to agree with them. I'm just saying, let's pray for them. I think it's important. Also, we want to model Titus 3.1-2. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, and to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, be gentle, and, and to show perfect courtesy to all people, Titus 3, 1 through 2. That courtesy means our governing officials. And though we might not agree, and they might be hindering uh, our, our life in significant ways, uh, we want to be submissive. And we want to speak evil of no one. Uh, and we want to be gentle. And we want to show perfect courtesy towards all people. And so just let those scriptures uh, reign in your heart. 
And let that be true of our LBC family, that we're courteous, we're gentle, we're kind, and uh, we're praying for those in leadership because we recognize we're in a hard time. And so uh, with that, uh, I'd like to just take a second here to pray and then move right into our passage, okay? Uh, Dear Jesus, we're so thankful for this time we get to open your word. Uh, We know it's different. Uh, We know it's not what we're used to, uh, but I pray you would speak to us, that you would uh, be with us, that your words would come and not mine. Pray you'd comfort our hearts and draw us close. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, church family. So here we go, Psalm 46. Uh, if you were listening to what my daughter read, you can see that this psalm was written in the midst of a lot of chaos. And it was written uh, in a time when there was uncertainty. And there's different opinions about where the setting takes place. Um, but it's very clear that this psalm is written in the midst of chaos and that to God is be the guiding presence in the midst of that chaos. And we want to look at God's word and see uh, how are we to look at this. And so first point we're going to look at, hopefully you're following in your bulletin that we have in the Church LBC app or uh, through email. We've had various forms. We've gotten it out there. But uh, first point in the bulletin is the nation's rage and the kingdom's totter. And that's very significant, what we see here in verse 6, that the, the nations are raging. They are upset. They are in a state of chaos. And so this is God speaking that even though the nations are raging, are raging and the kingdoms are in totter, that there's to be a calmness, that we're not to fear uh, because God is there. And we can see the, the nations in fear now in our own day. Uh, we're in a state of national turmoil and disagreement about what's the best course of action. Uh, some people think it's just a scheme. It's political idea. Some people think it's the pharmaceutical companies trying to make money. Other people say there's no danger. This is all fictitious. And there's some people that probably aren't going to leave their house till 2021 because they bought enough goods to last till then. So we have a variety of opinions. Uh, but the reality is that the nations are raising are raging, sorry, and and that there is uproar from Italy to China all the way to here. And I don't think I really uh, saw that uh, as I was all the way in Kenya, but the closer I got to home, uh, everything was just in disarray. And that imagery is set in our text, that things are an absolute craze. Uh, Verse 2 says, Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives away, though the mountains be moved into the hearts of the sea. I can't imagine a more terrifying sight than seeing mountains get swallowed up by the sea. Uh, That would be terrifying. And so the Bible's context is is perfect for what we're going through. And I don't think I really saw this kind of effect until I I noticed myself in Mount Elgon, uh, you know, in Kenya. I'm at the top of this remote mountain. And I'm getting ready to preach, and the pastor comes up, and he has this time where he gives instruction to his people. And uh, you go ahead and take a look at these pictures here. Uh, As you look and see them, you can see this is a really remote place. Um, I'm in the middle of nowhere. You know, it's two hours from the airport to get to Katali, and then it's another two hours up a dirt road to the middle of nowhere, to this huge mountain, uh, as you can see some pictures there. And uh, Pastor Stephen, the man in this last picture, uh, he gets up to his church and he says, hey, uh, we've just been notified of the coronavirus and we've been ordered that all people are to wash their hands before going into a public place. So he sends the whole church out. They go outside, they wash their hands, and then they reenter the church. And I'm sitting there and it just hit me like, wow, this is affecting even the most remote parts of the earth. These people are being told uh, about this virus and that it is, it is scary and they need to be cautious. And uh, I wasn't even in America and it just hit me there that there's people everywhere. As this pastor was trying to guide his people through this chaos uh, in a very remote part of the world. And so that got me starting to think, you know, and pray. And then on, when I returned uh, to Monday to ATS, uh, where I was teaching the seminary class, uh, the, the country of Kenya had shut down all of their classes. 
and it just became more real and more real to me. And then as I came home Tuesday, it was just like, wow, everything has changed. I feel like I'm in a completely different world. And I think that speaks to the level of how crazy things are. And you see that in verse two as well, that the mountains are being swallowed up into the sea. And so, but yet the Bible says, do not fear. You look at that very specifically in verse two, um, that that fear is, a sp- it has various meanings in the scripture, especially in the Old Testament. And so I want you to, to just ponder this for a second, that he's saying, while the mountains are sinking, do not fear. And what does he mean by fear? Well, we're basically going to walk through five different variations of fear that we see in the scripture that can be related to this word. The first one is an emotional fear. And so you, you remember when you, you think of the Jews on Mount Sinai and they see the huge raging fire, they are in fear. They're having an emotional reaction to a physical presence. They are seeing something and it's causing feelings in them. We know this type of fear when we see dead bodies, when we see big statistics, when we see huge lines, when we see no food on the aisles, we see people uh, we love and know freaking out. These images stick in our mind and they cause us to have this deep fear. Um, But I'm going to call this a rational fear. When you see a fire that's huge and you're scared, that's a rational response. And I would just like to acknowledge that if you are seeing these things and there is a fear inside of you from what you are seeing, um, that's okay. We see that in the scriptures and we want to acknowledge that. Um, For some of you, it's not an emotional fear. It's an intellectual fear. It is an anticipation of evil uh, with that ends up causing an emotional fear. And so you can see that in Genesis 31, 31, where Jacob's anticipating his family might be taken from him. So he's thinking about what's about to happen and what's about to cure, occur. And the more he thinks, the more scared he becomes inside. And so this is for the type of person that's just letting their mind run wild. They're thinking, what if I lose my job? If I lose my job, I have no money. If I have no money, I have no house. If I have no house, I'm out on the street. And it's all going to happen tomorrow. And then we're not going to have anywhere to go. And we're all going to die. And you've gone from your job to homeless and no food in 10 seconds. And you've allowed your mind to stir your emotions in a greater and greater and greater way. Um, I know that I have been drawn there before. Um, in my own thoughts, uh, this is the type of fear normally I experience. The more I dwell and I think and I make one connection to the next connection to the next con- connection, it can cause a sense of panic because the fear builds and builds and builds. And that's something we have to be cognizant of. And so what the Bible is saying here, whether you have emotional fear, like a fire, or you have rational fear that you think and you build, God says, fear not. Even if as something as great as the mountains going into the ocean happen, fear not. Even if you see the mountains trembling in verse 3 at the swelling of the waves. If you see mountains scared, do not fear. Don't have intellectual fear. Don't have emotional fear. And so this is very comforting that God would give this type of promise that we're to not fear, even though this magnitude of chaos could be occurring in our midst. And so this is very comforting for me. It's like, okay, God says, don't fear. Even if you see things of this magnitude, that poses the question though, what should we fear? Okay. This gets into the third type of fear. And that is, we should fear God. We should, it says, the nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utter his voice, the earth melts. That's what you fear. A God who has the ability 
to melt the earth. That is a sense of power that goes beyond our ability to comprehend that his words melt the earth. Um, the Bible also says Proverbs 9, 10, that the beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord. And so there is a part there that is in this third type, a reverence or an awe. You're realizing in your reverence or your awe that this is a great fear. God is greater. You look at a virus, you look at an earthquake, you look at a tornado, God's ability to melt the earth with his voice is greater. And this is the type of fear we're to have in worship, we're to have in awe. As you're singing, you're connecting in your head, you can do anything. You can do all things. You can crush anything. You can speak things into crea creation. You can take things away. You're, oh, wow, oh. And, you know, it's kind of like that. It's that reality within us that says you are bigger than circumstances. God's ability is bigger than anything in this world. I like to call this my dad's bigger than your dad. You know, do you remember that argument when you were a kid? And, and people will say, oh, yeah, well, I'll get my dad on you. And then the next kid goes, oh, yeah, well, my dad's bigger than your dad. What are they saying in that sentence? They are saying that they're not scared because their dad's bigger. This is that type of awe and reverence we're to have of our Heavenly Father, that He is bigger. He's bigger than anything we can see in this world. It's bigger than any tragedy, any natural disaster. Our dad's bigger. Our father's bigger. And that should cause us to have a sense of worship, uh, a sense of, oh my gosh, this is whom I am standing before and singing to. Wow. I'm in fear. I'm in awe. The fourth type is called uh, righteous behavior or piety. This is when worship has a cause and effect on us. The cause is God and the effect is righteous behavior, our right relationship with God, that we react to who he is through behavior. This is what we call relational fear. Um, I love my father and I don't want God's discipline, as we talked about in Hebrews, that God disciplines those whom he loves and that we don't want discipline from the father. We don't want to sin against the father. We don't want sin to create a relational barrier a distancing. And, and so we have a, what I would call a healthy fear that we love him and we don't want to sin against him. We want to do what is right. Um, it, it's kind of like this, you know, I didn't grow up with a dad, um, but my mom and I had our challenges. And I remember I looked at her and, you know, she was telling me to do something. And I looked at her and I said, you can't make me do that. And she looked at me and said, oh yeah. And she walked over she literally, she picked me up, threw me on my bed. I was airborne, boom, hit my bed. And I went, okay, there's a line there. There is a line and I can't cross it. I know my mom loves me, but I'm not going to push that far. And I'm not going to say, you can't make me. There's a healthy fear that I knew, hey, mom's in charge. But at the same time, she loves me. There's a line there. And so we want to have that relational fear towards God. He's our father. We don't want to do anything against what he would order us to do. Uh, the, the fifth time is what we would call formal religious worship. This is a fascinating one. It's probably my favorite. We see it in Job 1, 9. Job chapter 1, verse 9. When Satan says to God, does Job fear for no reason? And you can take that word fear and you can replace it with the word worship. Does Job worship for no reason? He is saying, is Job's worship, is his fear, is his obedience connected to circumstances? So God, Satan is asking God, your servant Job there, does his fear, is his worship just because he's got a lot of land, 
He's got a lot of money and he's got a beautiful family. If anything were to fall apart, that worship wouldn't be there. All of a sudden we see in, in the first couple chapters of Job that Satan goes and he takes away all that Job has. And what do we see? Job falls down and he goes, the Lord gives and the Lord takes. Blessed be his name. That is a form of worship that is not conditioned upon circumstances. That is a type of fear. It's an unconditional form of worship. It's an unconditional connection in the relationship that's not conditioned on what's happening around us. The other aspect is Job, or uh, sorry, Satan goes to God again and he says, what if I were to take his health? Then he would not worship. Then he would not fear. And God says, I will allow it. And so again, you see Job's health deteriorate. And again, you see obedience. And so when we look at this, is, is really it's an unconditional form of worship. It's an unconditional form of fear, obedience, not conditioned upon anything. And so what we see uh, in the scriptures right now, what we walked through, is there is a negative aspect of fear, and there is a positive aspect of fear. And if we're looking at the, the circumstances around us, we should allow the negative aspect of fear to drive the positive aspect of fear. We should absolutely acknowledge all of the things that could happen, the intelligence with our mind that we think through these things and we see this. And then we look at these things and we feel this. And then we weigh them against the sovereign God who creates, who has the ability to melt the earth with the words that he utters. And we say, nah, I got to let that fear go. I'm going to fear the one who can do all things. And that is what I would say are the biblical boundaries around how we should deal with fear. And this is why in verse 2, it says, therefore, we will not fear. Even if the mountains fall, even if the mountains tremble. And I've had to weigh these things out in my own life. And here's kind of how I processed it. And hopefully it'll be helpful for you. Um, when my wife Fawn was pregnant with our first child, Brayden, um, she had gotten in a car accident. She'd broken her collarbone and we didn't know that she was pregnant. So she got x-rays. She was on pain medication. And after we found out she was pregnant, we started to kind of worry like, Hey, you were on pain meds. You had, and you know, had x-rays and, and then all of a sudden she's throwing up every day. We're going right into the ER every other day. She's on IVs. Uh, we can't control it. And I'm just sitting there going like, I'm going to lose my wife. I'm going to lose my kid. Like I'm a, I'm a pastor. Like how is this supposed to happen? And I was beginning to condition my love, my understanding of God on my circumstance. I was fearful. How can you take these things from me? I was making a reality that wasn't there yet out of how I felt. It felt so real. And so I'm processing this with God. And I'm, I'm thinking. And, and as we're going back in this prayer, all of a sudden I get this sense of, are you going to deny all that I've done for you? All the ways I've been there for you. Are you going to deny that I sent my son to pay for your sin? And I'm like, no. No, I'm not going to deny all those things. And then all of a sudden I felt it's just, then trust me. Trust me. Take this fear and realize I'm bigger and trust me. Trust that I'm the one who can do all things, whatever I decide. I still love you. I'm still with you. I'm still able. And I really think that's how we can take the fear we're having now and channel it to having a proper fear of God, of obedience, of righteousness, of fatherly love, of unconditional worship. And, and so hopefully you are, are processing that as well now. Now, also what we see in the passage is fear not. But what's the other part of this fear not? It's verse 2. Therefore, we will, or sorry, verse 1. For God is our refuge and strength, 
a very present help in our trouble. And, and so this is saying, this is also part of it. Do not fear. God's your refuge. He's the one you can run to and he'll cover you. He'll comfort you. Refuge is a place of safety and comfort. It's a place where you can go and know nothing can harm you. That you know no one has his power. What's the power we're talking about? The ability to melt the earth. No one has his strength. No one is safer than running to God. So that begs the question, where are we running for comfort in these times? And what I can gather from talking to people and looking at social media is people are running to the media. People are running to social media. And it's stirring up their insecurities and it's stirring up uh, the chaos. It's stirring up more questions and it's creating more anxiety. And you're running to the wrong place. Information is not the solution to comfort. Uh, Oftentimes, Google can be our worst enemy. You know? You type in one thing about pain and all of a sudden you're going to die in 20 minutes. You know, hopefully we've all done that. I'm not alone in that, but it could be our enemy. And, and so that begs the question for you, where are you running for comfort? And it would be my contention that, that from the scripture, we're to run to God because he's our refuge, he's safe, and he is our strength, he is able. He's able to, to pr- protect us once we're there. And so that means we need to go to his word to comfort our hearts. What are the truths about scripture? You know, you read Genesis one, he speaks creation. That's the end of the story right there for me. That kind of power. I, I need to trust him. He, if he can speak things into existence, whoa, um, we need to go to him in prayer. That's that relational aspect of God. We're handing over our fear because we're in a safe place. We can be honest with him. We can tell him what our worries are. And then we can ask him to help us in that place of refuge while he's protecting us with his strength. And, and then I would say other Christians, and I'm going to qualify that as other Christians that are pointing you to God, that are pointing you to the Savior in Jesus Christ, that are pointing you to his word. Those are the Christians that are going to help you stay in the refuge, help you stay within the strength of God. Um, There's also no social distancing needed with God. He's not unable to touch us and be with us. There's no uh, effects the virus can can have on him, if you will. And and so we need to be in prayer then. You know, Jesus wasn't afraid of going and being around sickness. He healed leprosy. And, And so we need to be in prayer for people. We need to be lifting them up. We need to be reminding people. Hey, God loves you. God is able. And even if he doesn't take this illness or this sickness, he's with you. Uh, praying for our elderly, the ones who are in high vulnerability categories, categories. Hey, we love you. God's with you. God's sovereign. God's good. Can I help you? Can I reinforce this by showing you brotherly or sisterly affection as a brother or sister in Christ? You know, no one is stronger than God. He, Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead. Jesus protected the disciples from the sea. It's roaring. They're scared. He says, stop. It stops. He has the ability to hold us in his hand. John 6, John 10 says that no one can snatch us from the Father. These are all great things that should comfort our hearts as he is refuge and he is strength. But I would like you to think about this principle. Um, He cannot be our strength if he is not our refuge his refuge comes and then his strength comes because what happens you see over and over again in the scripture is read james he will draw near to us if we draw near to him god says come to me refuge strength i will protect you come to me safe i will protect you and so that stirs some questions are we running to him for comfort are we reading his her his word to train our emotions to teach what's going on in here what's proper and what's true are we pointing other people to god is our refuge and and here's the truth christians brothers and sisters lbc family we might get mocked for having a strong confidence that god is able 
And they might say, look at the world around us. How can you be comforted? How can you be confident? And this is what Psalm 46 is getting at. Though the mountains tremble, though the waves roar, do not fear. God is your refuge. God is your strength. And when it comes down to it, are we going to stand on those truths or not? Are we going to acknowledge those truths intellectually, but then deny them by our actions, by our social media posts, by our attitudes, by our conversations? We must not just intellectually agree that he is our refuge, he is our strength, that we will not fear. We must practice those things. We must practice them publicly. You know, right now we we aren't leaving our houses. So that's on the phone. That's on the internet. That's on social media. We're practicing God is our refuge. God is our strength. We will not fear. And so those are the things, you know, we might get made fun of, but that's okay. Uh, God made a promise. Another thing is if God is going to be our refuge, maybe we need to take a break from the TV. Maybe we need to take a break from our phone and just rest in the comfort and the safety of our God. Read your Bible. Pray to him. You might need to do it a lot. You might read and you're calm and then you start going and get a phone call and someone stirs your emotions, your anxiety. You got to stop, go back to his word. You got to pray. You got to call a Christian brother or sister in Christ. Say, hey, help calm me down. Help me go back to my refuge. Help me go back to his strengths. And so the next part of this is it's very fascinating. Let's go back to verse two. Verse two says that uh, he, sorry, verse one, that he's our refuge. He's our strength and he's very present help. I hope you see that very present help in trouble. That's, that's God saying, I'm ready and available for you. He is present. And again, James tells us this. If we draw near to him, he'll draw near to us. This helps us think of some bigger theological truths that I want to take that are maybe big, but but also make them small. God is transcendent, meaning he transcends time. He's bigger than everything in this world, but he is also in time. He is imminent. So even though he's really big, he is very present. He is with his people. He's ready to help you in a time of trouble. And and so maybe you think that, but you don't feel that. And that might be because you haven't taken some time to slow down. Slow down. And I think that might be one of the things God's teaching us is that we're such a busy people, myself included. I'll find myself getting through the day and it's like, wow, did I pray? Oh my gosh, how did I just run, 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 and not even talk to God. And I have to repent and say, God, I'm sorry. You know, right now is an opportunity for us to slow down, go to our refuge, recognize him as our strength. And then this leads us to the next part, to be still, to be still and know that he is God. That's verse 10. Because when we're in a place of comfort and he has the strength, we don't have to worry because he's got the strength and he's protecting us. So we have this opportunity to be still, to take a break from the noise, to take a break from the craziness, and just be still, to focus on what does his word actually say about who he is, and just kind of take a breath and just go, whew, this is crazy, God. Go to your Father in prayer. You're in a place of refuge. He has the strength. So you can be still. I think this is a very hard concept amongst Christians, uh, myself included. And what a unique opportunity to just take a moment and be still and know that he is God. What does it mean to know that he is God, that he's your refuge, he's your strength, he is very present, he is with you, and you should not fear. I mean, look at those five things that you can do in the presence of being still. And if you go through that process, these two things, they work hand in hand. You will be still. You will focus. You will acknowledge. You will worship. And you will 
exalt him. Next part of the verse, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations and I will be exalted in earth. Exalted means you will lift him up because if you are being still within the presence of his refuge, through the power of his strength, you're going to be still and realize he is bigger and greater than all things. That's that he transcends everything. I have a God who loves me. He proved it through sending his son to die for my sin. Wow. I'm, I'm in a good place, actually. If all this falls apart, if the earth actually melts, if the earth gives way, what we're seeing here in verse 2, then I'm going to go to heaven and be with my father eternally where there's no sin, there's no pain, there's no sickness, there's no tragedy. That's my home if all this ends. But if I'm going to remain, I'm going to exalt him. I have great hope. I have great comfort. I have a great father. And that has to be the transition we go to. We go to refuge. Then we see his strength. And then we are still, and then we exalt. Think of that process. You go to God because he can protect you. He can love you. And then you get to be still and and give him your worries and your anxiety. And then you can focus on his strength and his love and his mercy and his grace. You get to do all those things. And then as you realize he's able to do all those things, you exalt him. Tell your friends. Tell your social media friends, God is good. God is great. God is bigger than this virus. You need to know him. And frankly, to be honest, if you're not a Christian, you should fear death. Uh, Jesus is the only hope we have to not fear death, that Jesus conquered sin and death, that past the grave, we get to be with him. This is great hope to exalt among the nations that we get to be living examples to people around us that we are not in fear. We have a great God and we are going to praise him regardless of the circumstances, you know? And and that also means we're going to abide by the rules. We're going to listen to the government because God is in control. He's bigger than all these things. We're going to trust him. So here's our conclusion. What do we, what do we do with all this information? Here would be my first thought is that, you know, when we think through what's God doing in this, as your life has shrunk in your freedom and your options, here's a question I've been asking myself. What is God detoxing you from? What inside of you is, is raging like, oh, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. I'm so sad. I can't do this. That might mean you were too much in love with that thing. Your fear of it being removed was, your, was greater than your fear of the love of the Father, of the greatness of the Father. And you need to replace that thing with loving God more. It's not that these things are bad. It's that sometimes we love these things more than we love God. And when they get taken away from us, we realize, wow, I love that way too much. You know, Maybe you needed a detox from busyness. Busy, 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 busy. And God's saying, hey, you guys need to slow down. Come to me, your refuge. Rest in my strength. Be still. And then proclaim that I'm great. Because you actually took enough time to think and come to the reality that I am great. I am worthy of your worship, your praise, your love and affection. And you're like, yeah, you are. But it takes that stillness. Maybe do an inventory. Where are you? unbalance you know dads if you hear your kids saying hey it's so great for you to actually spend time with us there might be some imbalance there maybe you're spending too much time at work maybe you're spending too much time you know fill in the blank maybe you're not spending enough time with your family maybe you're not spending enough time with god you're not being still or maybe you're a bad friend you know but examine those things where are the imbalances in my life is god truly my refuge Is he where I run when I'm worried, scared? Or do I run to social media? Do I run to famous authors? Do I run to my bank account and go, oh, 
You know, what is that refuge? And how can you now shift to run to the Father? Um, here's, here's another one. Do you, do you, are you taking time to be still? Take those opportunities. Who is your plus one? You know, that's a question I've been asking myself is, okay, I have God, but I need this. When you look at the context of who God is, you don't need the money. You don't need the comforts. They're nice. They're great. And it hurts when they're gone. But if we practice being still and knowing he is God, we don't need a plus one. We need him. You know, and that's that act of worship that says, doesn't matter the circumstances. You are sufficient. And again, I love that John Piper quote. God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in him. It's coming to that realization that he satisfies. Um, one thing I would encourage you to do, listen to worship music. I know that's something my wife's been practicing. Um, but Martin Luther said this. He says, next to the word of God, music deserves the highest praise. The gift of language combined with the gift of song was given to man that he should proclaim the word of God through music. What a powerful statement. Music puts God's word in a way that speaks to our heart sometimes that we just can't parallel. And Martin Luther says that is second only to God's word itself. You know, listen to worship music. Let it train the affections in your heart and let it train your mind that God is glorious. God is worthy of praise. And as we think about worship, we're going to go into a time of worship now. We're going to sing two songs. We're going to sing, uh, I will look up. And we're also going to sing, this we know. Um, and it's my prayer that you can sing this we know with confidence that God's bigger than the world, that God uh, loves you, that God is ever present. He is with you and that God will get you through this, that you can truly up and know that he is God and know that he is good and know that he loves you no matter what's going on around you, that he is able. And so I pray that you just sing that. And it might be awkward in your living room with your family, but sing it, sing it loud because it's true, because you know he is your refuge, he is your strength. You will be still. You will know he is God. and You will exalt him. And you will exalt him right now in a time of worship. So I'm going to pray and then we'll, we'll move on to that piece. God, we thank you that you love us. You are with us. You're a good God. You're a gracious God. You are a sovereign God who is able. We pray that you would be our refuge, that we would know you as our strength, that we would come within your refuge and be still and know that you are God. And that would cause us to exalt of your goodness and your greatness and that we would keep doing that on a daily basis. We love you, God, so much. We pray that we would give you your due praise that we would know that you are God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All the worries of this world I will lay them at your feet Surrender every anxious thought For perfect your perfect peace All the loved ones I hold dear All my hopes and dreams and all my fears Lord, I will choose to trust your name in everything with everything I will look up. I will look up, for there is none above you. I will bow down to tell you that I need you, Jesus, Lord of all. Your Jesus, Lord of all. I will. 
will take you at your word. Jesus, you have taken hold of me. And all my life is in your hands. You are my strength. You are my strength. I will look up for the quiet our hearts now before the Lord. As we meditate now on the wondrous names of our God, won't you sing with me now, our Prince of Peace, our perfect healer, the King of Kings, and our mighty Savior. Sing with me now. A Prince of Peace, Perfect healer All my life and All my cares on you King of kings Almighty Savior All my life and All my cares on you Prince of peace Perfect healer This we know. This we know. We will see the enemy run. This we know. We will 
will see the victory come Cause we hold on to every promise you ever made Jesus, you are unfailing This we know We will see the enemy run This we know We will see the victory come We hold on To every promise you ever made Jesus, you are unfailing We trust you, we trust you, your ways are higher than our own, God we trust you, and we trust you, for your ways are higher than our own, sing that again, yes we trust you. We trust you, for your ways are higher than our own. God, we trust you, and all things we trust you, for your ways are higher than Together as a family, right now in your living rooms, join us to sing it one more time together, all ages, as one body. Let's all sing it together with one voice and confess it together. We trust you in all things. God, we trust you. Sing with us now. And we trust you. We trust you. Your ways are higher than our own. God, we trust you. We trust you. Your ways are higher than our own. In all things we trust you. We trust you. For your ways higher than our own. God, we trust you. We trust you. For your ways are higher than our own. So hear the word of the Lord as our benediction for this week from Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's take care of each other this week. Let's check in on each other as much as we possibly can. And we look forward to meeting virtually with you again next week. God bless you. Thank you.